Uh, now listen, I'm so you? happy. We have bro brother Paul, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I will say from China. Uh, I am so happy. We have, of course, Dom, uh, uh, Candace here from, uh, from Bali. Uh, I don't know where she's from, but she is around. Uh, of course, we've got all our dear brethren from Kenya, Ferdinand, Dominic, Wilson, Mark, and we've got brother Vincent and brother Jackson from Malaysia. <sighs> We just about spanned the entire globe. Okay, now let's start again. So we're going to be studying today about what must I do to be saved? Now, this is a very important study in that it tells us how to be saved, obviously. Last week we talked about sin and it's important it's not a, it's not a pleasant subject then but it's important that we understand it to make sure that we know how good the good news is without knowing how bad sin is the good news isn't so good so what we're going to do today is look about this idea. We're going to briefly talk about sin for a, for a little bit to, to, to bring in the, the context, but then uh, we'll talk about salvation. And, and that's the very reason why Jesus came to earth, as we saw. So I think everything's working now. I'm going to ask uh, my dear brother, Mark Masese, if you could unmute, brother, and lead us in a prayer to start with. Yes, let us pray. Yes. Our loving Lord, Heavenly Father, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Father, we have come before you this time, and it is the divine time that you have made for us to share your word. Thank you for the brothers and sisters from all over the world in the church, which is your church, the church of Christ. Thank you for our loving brother, brother Kate, for the study he is going to share with us. We ask you for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And as we are going to share, Father, lead us in everything as we are going to study, lead us in every scripture, in everything that we are going to share, may your will be done. We ask you through the name of our Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, so let us now begin. We're going to start with a, a slideshow study. Uh, Okay. Right. Okay. So what must we do to be saved? Now, I, I've mentioned this before, that I, I know practically everyone on this study knows what they must do to be saved. But we all need to be reminded about the good news. But the main reason I'm sharing this, this, this series with you is so that you preachers and teachers can share these words with other people as well. People who need to be saved, new Christians, and, and, and people who want to be teachers in the church. Or that, that's the reason for this. Uh, and I know already that some of you are using these studies in this way and that makes me happier than i can express i'm very thankful for that and uh i'm humbled by it okay so now what must i do to be saved is the most important question that can ever be asked of course many people in the world don't realize the importance but but really when it comes down to it 
God has given us the choice, and there's really only two choices that matter. The first choice is do we want to go to hell or do we want to go to heaven? Now, any person in their right mind would say, no, I do not want to go to hell. So that really leaves only one option for us. And so that's why this question is in so, so important. What must I do to be saved? Now, the reason we need to be saved is because of sin. We studied last week in First John 3 and verse 4 that, that sin is lawlessness. And that sin uh, separates us from God. We cannot be saved when we are still in our sins. This is the reason that Jesus came to save us from our sins. In Romans 6 and verse 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Here are those two situations. We earn from our sin death. But this isn't talking about physical death. This is talking about spiritual death. The death that Adam and Eve suffered when they were cast out of the garden. The separation that is spiritual death. But on the other hand, we have the free gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is salvation. This is the, the saved that we're looking at. Now, I want you to notice very carefully, and this is a, a topic for another study, and it's something that you, you brethren could do yourself. But we need to understand all the blessings that are in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul gives us a, a large and comprehensive list of the things that we are blessed with in Christ. But I just want to read out verse 3, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, sorry, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenly places in Christ. You see? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. <laughs> This is where we have the blessings. Now, the world may say there are many ways to heaven. I've heard people say this. I've heard people who say they're Christians say this. You go your way, I'll go our way. We'll all meet together. It's not what the Bible says. It's certainly not what Jesus said. Jesus said uh, in, in John uh, 4, and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, uh, comes to the Father, rather, but through me. Now, there are many ways to die spiritually. We can sin in many, many different ways. And it seems that some men and women spend their time inviting new, in inventing, rather, inventing new ways to sin. But we know that there is only one way to be saved, and that is through Christ Jesus and in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a wonderful passage uh, in Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, we see we've got there on, uh, on, on the screen uh, verse uh, verse 9, but I want to read a little bit more than that, so bear with me while I turn there. Uh, we'll read there from Hebrews 5, starting in verse 7. 
In the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, for many people, I don't know, I don't know about in your country. I can only talk about people in my country in Australia. But many people do not like the idea of obedience. And throughout the Bible, we read of time and time again, people did not want to obey. The Jewish people, the Jewish nation, were a people who did not want to obey. Now, this is important that we understand it. Here we're told that Jesus learned obedience. Here is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and he came down to earth and he learnt obedience. And how does this affect to us? Affect us? Well, through his obedience, he was perfected on the cross and he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. There's only salvation in Christ Jesus, and there is only salvation through obedience in Christ Jesus. Now, I know that you all know people who believe in faith only, right? They say, no, 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 no. You don't have to, to do this. You don't need to do that. That's, that's your earning salvation. We're saved by faith only. We don't have to do anything. Well, I don't know how they deal with a passage like this. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. My friends, we have to obey Jesus in order to be saved. Now, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, uh, I've, got, I've got half of my screen covered in this, in this system. So let me turn over to, to my, my, in, in my Bible to the book of Titus. Titus 3 verse 5, it says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now, while we have to be obedient, there's no question about that, that will not earn us our salvation. I, I like it, liken it to this way. Now, we know that Jesus is our king. We know that we uh, he is our lord and we are his servants right well let's think about it in a in a worldly setting if you if you had a king uh, or a lord in your village or you had someone over you that you just loved and recognized their authority part of you showing that love would be you would do what they say. That's, of course, just in a worldly way. Surely, if you truly believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, that he is the one who died for your sins, that he paid the price on the cross, surely, if you recognize that he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, you will do what he says. Jesus says in the book of Luke, this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet do not do what I say? Yep, this is the situation 
that we see today as well. So many people say that they believe, but they do not obey what he says. You know, the term Lord comes from the idea of a master of slaves. When we become Christians, we need to see ourselves as slaves of Christ. That you read through the introductions to the letters in the New Testament, and time and time again, you'll see Paul say he's a bond servant of Jesus Christ, a slave, that means. And so we do what he says. Okay. Now, we see the great commission here. Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 18 through 20. I, 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 I will ask you, when in our question and answer time, if the screen is covered for you, because it certainly is for me. And if so, I will, next week, I will modify the screen, because I can't read this passage all of it. So here we go. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me uh, in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, now, excuse me. Excuse me one minute, my dear, dear friends. We had, we skipped a groove here. Okay, I have to admit, I do not know what's happened here. We'll stop, stop this, this share and continue. Uh, bear with me. Continue on the study from the... Um, from my notes. <laughs> Technology oftentimes doesn't do what, what we want. Okay, now, uh, in Luke chapter 19, uh, we read uh, in verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The purpose that Jesus came uh, from heaven to earth was to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. He came so that those who sinned could be saved. And so we recognize now as his, uh, as his uh, uh, disciple that we follow his teaching. Now bear with me. Oh, I am so glad that you brethren are so patient with me. Sometimes I feel like an old man who makes mistakes. But, and maybe I am, but the technology that we have sometimes uh, uh, is, uh, is confusing to me. Okay, here we go. So I'll, I, 
I know I know the, the problem that I had here. Okay, now, good. In Luke chapter uh, 6 now, we notice in verse 14. So Jesus came to seek and save the, the lost. That was his mission. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 14, uh, notice what we read. Well, uh, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, what this is saying is that Jesus is our, is our, uh, is our teacher. As his disciple, we need to become like our teacher. We need to have the same mission that Jesus had. And that takes us to our uh, Matthew chapter 28. Now, at the end of uh, Jesus' time here on earth, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he spent about 40 days with the disciples. And he gave them the Great Commission. Notice, Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. That's the first thing we need to do. We need to be willing to go and preach to people. Uh, we make disciples of the nation. We make just the same as we are. And so that they will follow Jesus. We baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and then we teach them what the Bible teaches. I, I liken it as we teach to first make Christians, then we baptize them, and then we teach them all the scriptures. This great commission is also found in, uh, in Mark chapter 16. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized will be saved, but he who has disbelieved will be condemned. Once again, we see we have to go. We cannot just sit around in, uh, in our church buildings or in our houses and wait for people to come to us. We go out seeking people who need salvation and we preach the gospel to them. And, of course, then we get what Jesus taught. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. The belief isn't just something that's up here. It's here that causes us to obey Jesus. People who truly believe will obey. And we're baptized in order to be saved. We also see over in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke 24, verse 46. And he said to them, it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So repentance from forgiveness of sin. Jesus taught us all these things, and these are what we have to do. Matthew's account state, uh, states, that, that states that disciples were made by going to preach to all the nations, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to follow all of Jesus' teaching. Mark's account states that people are saved when they hear the gospel preached, believe what they have heard, and are baptized for the forgiveness of those sin, of their sins. Those who don't believe that well, they will be lost. Luke's account states that all nations must hear the preaching about Jesus and repent repent. It's not that these are different commissions 
that Jesus gave. He gave one commission, and these are all different aspects of it. Now, what we have to do is we have to be willing to go out and preach the gospel. Now, we have some wonderful accounts in the scriptures of the gospel being preached. I want to have a look at just one now with the uh, Philippian jailer. We're going to go into this in more detail next week. Uh, but here we see, you remember that uh, Paul and Silas, this is in Acts chapter 16, if you want to turn in your Bibles to it. Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, and then uh, they were expecting to be killed the next day, but God had other plans. Uh, and, and, and he caused an earthquake to come and shook the prison, opened the gates, and loosened their chains. Uh, and uh, we see here, uh, in, in verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came... A, a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Then the jailer awoke and he saw the prison doors open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And he, and he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, as I said, this is going to be next week's topic as we continue unlocking the Bible. But from what we've seen, we've seen that the answer to that question is that we need to preach the gospel so that people can hear, because faith comes by hearing. The, the people, they need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We read that in Matthew, in, in, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. They then have to repent of their sins. They need to turn around from their sinful lives. And then they need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Then they need to continue faithfully. Okay, now I've got a video. I make no promises that this is going to work. As I said, all my systems has changed from what I normally have. But that's okay. We can make it work. Uh, there may be a bit of lag in the, in the video part, but the sound, I've tested it and it should be fine. Okay. Hello and welcome back. My name is Keith Thompson <laughs> and I'm, I'm not having any luck today. Right. <laughs> oh, there we go. Sorry about that video. It's more like stop and start, but that's okay. Now, uh, this is when I hand it over to you, brethren. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions, uh, please, please feel free to, uh, to unmute yourself and, uh, and just say, say what you feel you need to say. Thank you so much, Brother Kate, for a very good study. And thanks also for your time in, in Bali. Um, this is a very great lesson to us, all of us, and also to our congregations here where we worship, and also to our neighbors, our friends, to whom they need to hear about this. And you mentioned a very good scripture in the book of Acts of Apostles, chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were in prison. 
and I was sharing with a brother about salvation. And he, I asked him, is that from a denomination? And I asked him, why do you pray for people to get salvation? And to repeat certain words, like uh, repeat before me, say, Lord Jesus, I come before you, say that my sins have been forgiven, erase my, my, my name in the book of evil. Where are you reading this from? Are they written anywhere in the scripture so that we can all share together that you can pray for someone and they can get salvation? He told me that is how he was taught that he can pray for someone and someone can get salvation. And he can actually pray for a group of people to receive salvation by repeating the words after him. And I kept on questioning him. And then he opened the same book that you read, the book of Acts chapter 16. And he read verse 31 and said, if you believe you get salvation, the way Paul replied to that security, security man. And he stopped from that verse. And I told him to continue reading and see what, the, what that person did after being told to believe, we see that he was baptized with his um, family and he received salvation. So you cannot believe alone and you get salvation. You need to believe and get baptized just the way uh, Jesus Christ himself commissioning us in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 28, 18, and also when the people were asking Peter what they need to do to get salvation in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. They need to believe and be baptized to receive salvation. So prayers plus believe is not equivalent to salvation. Believing alone cannot be equivalent to salvation, but believing plus baptism you receive salvation. So it is a very, very good study that we need also to share with brothers and sisters so that they get to understand the way my friend, the way my the friend to which I was sharing with. He stopped from verse 31. But when we read through after 31, we were able to see how that um, security guard was able to receive salvation with his family. Uh, thank you so much. That is all the comment I had. But now I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, in the book of Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, the words of Jesus Christ himself, that you, we need to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the words of Peter from Acts chapter 2, verse 38, believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. When we go to baptize people, when we have preached to them, they have believed on our way, in our, in our teachings, and now they want to receive salvation through baptism. Just before we dip them into water, do we say what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, that baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, or we do in Acts of Apostles, chapter 2, verse 38, believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So do we say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, or I baptize you in the name of, on the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? That is the question that I have. That's an excellent question, Dominic. Thank you. Thank you. You give, you, give, you give great comments, and I really do appreciate that. You know, when, the, when the, that jailer was told to believe on the Lord, that's just the first step. The next verse is, and they taught the word of God to him, and immediately he was baptized. The first step is to believe. Yeah. Okay, now, in the name of, what does that mean? 
Well, I put it to you that I believe it means that by the authority of this, it, it, it's talking about whose baptism it is. And in Matthew, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, was Peter wrong in Acts 2 when he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus? Well, no, he wasn't wrong. He, it's written there in the scriptures. There's nothing to indicate that he was wrong. So what, what do we have here? In the name of means by the authority. Now, we know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. There is one authority. Who's, who is the owner of the baptism? Whose baptism is it? Well, it's Jesus' baptism, right? And so, by saying the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and by saying Jesus, we're saying the same thing. It's the same authority. Now, think to every example of a baptism in the Bible. Is there any words ever recorded that the one doing the baptizer baptism said i've never read when paul baptized people he said this when philip baptized people he said that no the teaching comes when people understand what the baptism is for there's not like uh like the catholics would have a, a sacred phrase that we need to see, or these holy words that make the baptism real. What makes the baptism real is the understanding of the, the sinner that this is Jesus' baptism, and that baptism is for forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm saying this to you here who are assembled, but a new Christian they they get worried about this and so i'll tell you what i say not that it makes the baptism or if i didn't say it would cancel the baptism by i say i say them both i say i baptize you in the name of the father son and holy spirit you are being baptized in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of sin but that's only for the new Christian. I don't, I don't believe we have to say it. Otherwise, what would, what would come of that poor person who was baptized and nothing was said? Maybe the person doing the baptism didn't know. Would, would that mean that that poor person wasn't saved? No. We are saved when we recognize that the baptism is the Christian baptism, the baptism that is under the authority of God, the baptism that is for forgiveness of sin. That's what we've got to let people know. Does that answer your question, Dominic? Maybe not what you're expecting, but... Yes, yes, yes. That answers my question. <laughs> now, Martin, you've been very patiently with your hand up. I can see you. Ferdinand, I see you as well. But Martin has uh, had the, the little symbol up. So we'll go, go Martin and then Ferdinand, okay? Martin, go. Well, thank you so much, Brother Kay, for today's study. You know, this mid-morning when I woke up, uh, the first time I checked my Facebook, I have a friend of mine and he's on the screen here today. His name is Dimi Dom in Facebook. <laughs> uh -huh. And one of his status in Facebook was the plan of salvation. And that is what we've studied today. Well, that's great. Um, but uh, I also noted in the chat section where my question is coming from. I just don't know if I understand this correctly. 
I know that in our studies today, you will not, uh, you will not mention this verse that I've noted there, mm -hmm. but uh, I just want to know if I understand this correctly. Yeah. So in, uh, in John chapter, in John chapter six, verses 65. I starting to get dark in Mali. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in verse 65, it says, and he said, so let's know that this is Jesus, right? And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So uh, this is, I'm using uh, the English standard version, that would be ESV. But I know there's some versions which says that no one, uh, uh, instead of granted him by the Father, it says unless it is given him by the Father. Yeah. yeah. So my concern is this, and this is where my question is coming from. It is given him by my Father. So when Jesus says that no one can come to me unless it is given him by the Father, so is Jesus speaking about when what, what is given to this person here that Jesus speaks about that is being given to this person by his father? Is Jesus speaking about the opportunity, the teaching of the gospel and the opportunity to, res to respond? Is this, is, is this what is given to him by the father or is he speaking of something else? Yeah, I, I believe that is a, a good understanding of it. I, I hadn't uh, thought about it in, in those words. Let me let me just look it up here on my phone and I'll get a, a, a definition of that word granted. Okay. Okay. So uh, the words is to give, present, to supply, uh, so there's lots of words, to grant, permit, allow, yeah, and so I, how I've always taken this verse is that we have to, God, send his son to die for us, and we have to follow, God is even the head of Christ, the Father. And so we have to follow the plan that he had from the very beginning to send his son and then the, 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 the gospel plan of salvation. Now, these people in John chapter 6, it's a little bit confusing, this chapter. This was after Jesus had fed the multitude and they followed him and they followed him not because of who he was, but because they wanted more food. <laughs> they wanted to have free food. And that's when he said uh, the difficult words, uh, verse, uh, verse 53. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Now, the people who were just looking for food were carnally minded people. They were thinking of fleshly things and they were supposing that Jesus was talking about cannibal cannibalism. But you see, for those to whom it was granted, look at things in a spiritual manner. And of course, we recognize that the words that Jesus speaks, these are what he's talking about. We have to partake of those. So I think you're right in saying that it is the gospel. That's the larger picture. That you can only come to God in the way that he has given us. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven but he who follows, who obeys the will of the Father 
who was in heaven. Uh, does that make sense to you, Martin? Yeah, that makes sense. Great, thank you so much. Now, Ferdinand has, has disappeared on us. Maybe he'll come, come back uh, and we'll get to his question. But, but Candace uh, in the text uh, has asked me in a d direct message uh, in uh, how would you best explain grace versus the law of Christ? Oh, well, this can be confusing when we think of it in denominational uh, friends. Now she's she's got the verse here in John. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Someone hasn't muted and they've got an alarm. Okay, uh, John six verse. Uh, sorry, Romans six verse fourteen. Uh, okay. For sin shall not be master you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay. Now, here, the book of Romans, when practically throughout the book of Romans, it's not the law of Christ that it's talking about. It's talking about the, the law of Moses. And that was the big argument that he was, uh, he was having when he was trying to explain that. We've got to remember, first of all, that everyone who was ever saved, they were saved by grace through faith. You cannot be saved except by grace through faith. Now, what the trouble is, is our denominational friends don't understand either of those two terms. Grace means it, we get something that we don't deserve. In our studies, we've seen that we all deserve death. We don't deserve anything else. So our salvation is only through the love and kindness of God. That's the grace side of it. Our side of it is faith. Now, what we've really been studying today is that faith isn't just our mental thinking, yes, Jesus is Lord, it means we follow through. True faith is an obedient faith. In fact, the book of Romans starts talking about the obedience of faith, and it finishes in chapter 16, it talks about the obedience of faith. Faith is all, in the Bible, is always obedient faith. In fact, James calls a faith that isn't obedient dead. Okay, so here it's talking about we are not under the law of Moses, but under the law of grace. Another way of talking about the law of grace is the law of Christ and how we obey him. Okay, now I see Ferdinand is back with us. Uh, you had a question, my dear brother. Just unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother Keith. You're very welcome. First of all, uh, I would like to pass my greetings to, to the brethren uh, who have joined us today. It's been a while since I, since I was since I joined the meeting, but due to some other problem that I couldn't avoid. Uh, so first, I have a comment, and my comment is about the plan of salvation. Actually, I was uh, I was uh, I was chatting with one of my friends uh, back at the universities, and. Uh, 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 and he, he told me, he, he was just telling me that uh, he's also in that process, he, he's actually not, uh, not, have, not have completed the plan of salvation to mean that he is not baptized and is not a member of Church of Christ. So he, he was trying to ask me some question and we were talking about the plan of salvation. So my question is that, he, he, is it okay if, like us in our church, we have a baptism kit 
and uh, baptism kit. Uh, when I say uh, baptism kit, you know that is something made that you can fill up water and you baptize an, an individual. And also there is also the the big, the large waters, the big waters, and also there is a swimming pool. Is is it okay if we can maybe baptize someone in a swimming pool, or uh, or 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 is there a difference between baptizing someone in the swimming pool and the, and using the baptism kit, and also maybe baptizing someone in the large waters like the lake, the rivers, and the oceans? Is it so? It, it, what's the difference? I, I just wanted to know about that. That's a very good question, Ferdinand, because people get confused about this. I, I met one person one time that didn't want to be baptized in the swimming pool because all the sins would stay there. <laughs> but that's not true. It's a spiritual washing that we're going through. Now, so let's think about in the scriptures. Uh, we're not told where anyone was baptized. When the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized, remember, he said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And they got out of the chariot. They went down into the water, Paul, as well as the eunuch, uh, sorry, Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized them. And then he came up out of the water. Was that a swimming pool? We don't know. It's unlikely that it was, but was it just a small body of water or was it a lake? We don't know. It doesn't matter. It's a bit like when we do burials. You know, clearly in Jesus' day, a burial was in a tomb and there was a large rock rolled over. But that's not the only way that burials were, 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 were done. Just like, you know, we might think of this different ways of burying here. But what we need is we need much water, enough water to cover the person, to bury them. You know, if we bury, if we bury someone who dies, <laughs> We don't want to bury them with their hands sticking up out of the ground, do we? <laughs> and so what I do, what I do, whether it's in a, a, in a baptismal pit, uh, uh, a swimming pool, a lake, or a river, I'm very, I'm very quiet, and this is a very peaceful time because we're gonna have a new birth. And you know, when a baby is born, you don't want all sorts of excitement and splashing and carrying on. So I speak very quietly to the person and I tell them exactly what I'm going to do. Whether I put them straight down under the water or I lay them back, I explain to them. I get them to, to hold their nose with their hand like that. Right? And then I put my hand over it. So that way the water doesn't get up their nose. And I say, I'm going to put them under the water, but it'll only be for one or two seconds. I then gently lay them down and then look, are you completely under the water? It takes one second to do that. And then I can bring them up. And then everyone, I and all the witness can say, yes, you are fully immersed. That is all you need to worry about. Are they fully immersed? Now, you may, because we're dealing with uh, people who are not, I, I was going to say new Christians, but these are, these are people who are not born again yet. They may say, no, I don't want to be baptized there. I want to be baptized in the river. That's okay. I will baptize them where they want to be. Okay. I don't say, no, you have to be baptized here. I'm, we're kind people. And so I say, okay, we go there. So I, I will go where people want. I have a, we have in, in, in Armadale in, in Australia, 
we have a very nice uh, river with beautiful pools, very natural setting. And uh, I suggest that. My son was baptized in the river near the city. Uh, I had a sister who said, I want to be baptized in the ocean. So we went to the ocean. Yeah. I know in, in Malaysia, they have a, a, a plastic pool that they use. And I've baptized people there. And that's okay too. Does that answer your question, my brother? Yes, I'm comfortable. I'm, I'm truly grateful and I'm, thank, I'm very thankful. <laughs> Good. Oh, now we ask our dear brother Paul. Now, uh, those people who weren't here at the beginning, our brother Paul is visiting us from China. And it's our privilege to see you here tonight. And we hope we can see you many times after this, brother. You have a question, I believe. I see your, your hand is up on the screen. You need to unmute yourself first. Look for the unmute button. Not that you turn your video off. There should be a speaker there with a cross, a microphone there with a cross through it. Oh, wait. Hey, Hello, go. Keith. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Lovely to see Hello, you. Hello, brother. I am very glad to be here. Uh, when you talk about the ba baptism, I record the situation. When I went to Bali Island many years ago, and uh, today, I saw, uh, I met my Bible teacher, Candice, uh, after many years ago. And I found, found that uh, my Bible teacher, Candice, are very fine. I am so glad. You know, many, many years ago, my Bible teacher, Candice, by baptized me in the ocean near, uh, near a beach in Bali Island. So the situation was very wonderful and uh, very exciting moment, you know. Um, yeah, just like um, Keith, you said, uh, like this, like <laughs> like this um, moment uh, for three seconds. Yeah, very interesting, very secret. You know, uh, from that day on, I find myself uh, as if uh, I am I am I am a new person. I am a newly born. That's very secret. So I always thank, I always thank my Bible teacher, Candice, because of her, I, uh, I was born, I was newly born, you know. So thanks to my Bible teacher, Candice. And now I want to e express my uh, I, I mean, I, I'm very grateful, uh, and uh, I think, Keith, you are my another Bible teacher from from today. I think so. You did a very good job uh, at Zoom. That's very. It's very convenient for the people all around the world to learn Bible. That's wonderful. Without uh, go abroad, without go to Australia to see Keith, without uh, going outside to meet 
our Bible teacher Kenneth, we can learn Bible easily on the internet by Zoom, this wonderful app. So thank God for giving us so wonderful Bible studies. That's very wonderful. Thank God again. Thank my Bible teacher, Candice, gives me very all good opportunities to know my other Bible teacher, Kate. You give us very good opportunity. You give us a lot of happiness. Um, so in my life, you are my, uh, what should I say? You are the person. I, I always honor who I always honor. So I'll give you a them, <laughs> give you a them. And uh, my question is, when I read the Bible, when I read the Bible, you know, English is a Latin, foreign language for me. It is a little difficult when I read Bible. I always meet new words in the Bible. Uh, so it, uh, it makes me less understand the, the whole meaning of the sentence. Yeah. Uh, I really want to look for some Bible dictionary. Uh, I don't know whether there is a Bible dictionary in the world. I don't know. You know, I, I am just a beginner. Yeah. I am a just a beginner, so I don't know many things about the Bible. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, my question is, how should I do? When I met uh, some English new words in the Bible, and um, my second question is, uh, and yesterday I wrote an email to you, Keith. Have you uh, have you received it? And uh, not yes. Uh, yeah, I thank you. I got an email from you thanking me for the uh, for, for inviting you to Zoom. Yes, I got that. Okay, that that's all. That that's very wonderful. Yeah. No, we are in contact. Thank you. Yes. No, I got that. Now, um, so so at the moment you're studying from an English language Bible, are you? Yes, Candice sent me an English Bible many, many years ago from the United States before she came to, before she came to Bali Island. Okay, now what, what? what an IV, an IV. An IV, okay, good. That's, that's, that's a good one to, a good beginner English Bible. Now, what, what is- Oh, by the way, what is your dialect that you 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 speak? My, uh, uh, you mean American English or British English? Chinese. Oh yeah, my mother tongue is Chinese. Which which, which Chinese dialect? Uh, Mandarin. Mandarin. Okay. Yeah, Putonghua. Okay. We have, a, we have a, a Chinese brother here, Vincent. He may be able to help us, but I will do some research and see if I can get a Mandarin Bible and I can send that to you. Yeah, I have, I have Mandarin Bibles, Bible. Okay, you do. Okay. Published okay, so, in Hong Kong. So, uh, from Hong Kong, okay, good. Excellent. So that, what I would do was compare the, the NIV English with your Mandarin Bible. I, I do that with my English translations. 
to compare what they say, to get a better understanding. That would be the first thing I would do. And then I, I, I'm not sure what you're able to access uh, in China, but I also use the internet to define words as well. So maybe, maybe try those two things and see how you go, okay? Sorry? Try those two things, comparing, like if you have a, a verse in the NIV, look at what the Mandarin says, the same verse. Okay? And if you still- Excuse me. Go ahead. Ah, excuse me, Kate. I mean, I want, uh... On the one hand, I want to understand uh, the Bible by using a foreign language, that is English language. On the other hand, uh, through learning the Bible, the Holy Bible, I really want to improve my English. I mean, in, enlarge my English uh, vocabulary in the listening, speaking, uh, writing, etc. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my real meaning. So I don't want to use I don't want to use Chinese uh, edition. Okay. I think which uh, which cannot uh, improve my English level. You know. Okay. I, I I follow you now. So what I would do is I would do a word search on the internet to define your word just put in the word and dictionary and you'll get a many many uh many uh choices there that that would be what i would do so so is it necessary for me to uh, uh i mean please uh please in introduce some uh, uh, professional or I mean special dictionaries for Bible. Yeah, you you will be able to find them online. Sorry, you'll be able to find them on the internet. I will send oh. you. I will send you an email with some some links. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay. Well, you are per my, my dear brethren, our time has come to an end now. I'm going to ask Dominic if you would mind closing in prayer for us. Sure. Let us pray. Our, our dear Lord, we thank you so much because of this wonderful study together with brothers and sisters across the globe. We thank you so much because of our teacher today, Brother Kate, who is in Bali. Lord, we bless you because of the great word that we have learned about how to become a Christian. And we pray that the word and the teachings that we have received from your scripture will help us also with the, together with the brothers and sisters in our localities. Thank you because of Brother John in China, Candice, uh, Eddie, and everyone who have been able to join, Lord, that you may help us to get this word clearly in our hearts and to continue to grow in our hearts and to just improve our spiritual growth. We thank you so much because of your son, Jesus Christ, that died on the cross, just because of our salvation that we have right now. It is through grace that we got salvation and we don't take it for granted other than to every day continue to obey you and to honor you and to keep your word so that we can be holy as we prepare our hearts to be received by you. Lord, we thank you so much because of everything that is happening in the world. Remember our country, Ukraine, Russia, whatever they're going through, continue to protect them because they are your people. Thank you so much because of everyone in the world, the sick, the hospitalized, the deceased, Lord, we just want to remember them, that you continue to be with them. Help us tomorrow as we prepare for our services, worships, that Lord, you'll be with us. I keep your word 
that you will always be with us when we be with you. I pray this short prayer through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, my dear brethren. You have everyone. Goodbye. Lord bless you. Have a good day tomorrow. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye -bye.